Okay, so our topic for today is introduction to epidemiology. So we will see that what are the learning objectives of this lecture. Uh, the learning objectives of this lecture are uh, by the end of the lecture, you should be able to know that uh, what is epidemiology, what are the different diseases, uh, theories of disease causation, and what are the different epidemiological study designs that we have. So, first of all, we would see that what is epidemiology. So, basically, epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of health-related states or events in specified population and the applications of this study to the control of health problems. Another definition is by the green board, which includes signs of mass phenomenon of infectious diseases. And another definition is branch of science, which treats epidemic. So this can best be exemplified by the COVID-19 epidemic, which uh, started in uh, 2020 and which uh, took control of the whole uh, world. And there was no one who can say that uh, he or she was spared from the disease. So uh, by studying epidemiology, we are able to study the different patterns and how the humans are infected by those particular diseases. Uh, moving on, there are three components of epidemiology. First is disease frequency. Second is distribution of disease, uh, which can be described by time, place, and person. And third is determinant of disease, which is cause or risk factor of that disease. Okay, so before we proceed forward, there are uh, certain terms that need to be understood well for understanding epidemiology. The first of which includes epidemic. So what is epidemic? Epidemic is disease occurrence among the population that is in excess of what is expected in a given time and place. For example, uh, epidemic can be described uh, as a, a disease occurrence in a population that is more than what is normally expected at a given time and place. This can be exemplified by, uh, for example, uh, if there is more than normal occurrence, for example, there is cholera after the flood that we saw in Pakistan last year. So normally we have limited cases of cholera at a particular place, for example, in interior sense. But due to, the, uh, due to some conditions like flood, there was widespread damage of water infrastructure and sewage infrastructure due to which more than normal cases of cholera were reported. So that can be classified as epidemic. Next, we move to what is endemic. Endemic can be defined as a disease or condition that is present among the population at all times. So this can be best exemplified by the hepatitis B or hepatitis C cases in, uh, uh, in Karachi. For example, there are uh, fixed normally we can say that hepatitis B, hepatitis C, or hepatitis A is endemic in our region. There are there are fixed number of cases that are normally there in developing countries like Pakistan. And then there is pandemic. Pandemic, as I was telling in the previous slides, that it is a disease or conditions that across spread across continent. There are it transcends the boundaries of countries, continents, and regions. So a disease which has spread globally, it would be classified as pandemic. For example, COVID pandemic. Next, we move on to incidents. There are uh, terms like incidents and prevalence, which we are going to study in the whole uh, CHS uh, community health sciences. And for understanding the epidemiology better, we should have an idea of what is incidence and what is prevalence. So before I explain this term, I want you to imagine that uh, there is a coffee shop and there are people entering into that coffee shop. So uh, the coffee shop contains a number of people that are already sitting there and then new people or uh, new persons are entering that coffee shop one by one. So that new persons that are entering that coffee shop, that would be classified as incidents and the people who are already sitting in that coffee shop would be a classified in uh, uh, if we uh, if we give an analogy, it would be classified as prevalence. So likewise, incidence is the number of new cases that is occurring in a defined population during a specified period of time. So it is calculated by a formula, which is the number of new cases of a specific disease during a given time period 
divided by population at risk during the time period multiplied by 1000. So, for example, if there are 500 new cases in a population of 30,000, then the incidence rate would be classified by the formula uh, and it would be 16.7 per 1000 per year. So, as incidence uh, gives us an idea about the new cases, so the incidence rate is the number of cases that is occurring during a specified time period and it is dependent upon the size of population during that period. Then calculating rate, as I told you earlier, the rate helps us to compare health problems among different populations. That includes two or more groups who differ by a selected characteristic. The rate formula, as I told you, it is the number of cases divided by population at risk. The number of cases of the illness, the size of population at risk, and of course the period during which we are calculating the rate. Then, uh, as I told you earlier, that incidence is the new are the new cases. So, by new cases, it would mean that we are getting information about the gene mutation, the different strains that are that, that are happening, and our inability to control the disease by exist by employing the existing measures that are failing. So, it is what would be the use of incidence rate? It would be the uh, helpful for taking action to control disease for research into etiology and pathogenesis, distribution of disease, efficacy of therapeutic and preventive measures. And if the incidence is increasing, it indicates failure of current control programs. Then another terminology that is very important is prevalence. Prevalence basically refers to the all current cases, old and new, which are existing at given point of time or over a period of time in a given population. So as I told you earlier, uh, the example of coffee shop, the people who are already sitting, the people who already have the disease at a given point of time over a period of time in a given population, that would be prevalent. So prevalence means the existing number of cases, both new and old. So what would be the use of prevalence? The most important use of prevalence would be to estimate the magnitude of disease problems that are existing in the community and for administrating and planning purposes. For example, the number of hospital beds, the manpower needs, the number of doctors, rehabilitation facilities, uh, and uh, the number of ventilators, etc., etc. So this this is the uh, this is the use of prevalence. Then we have different epidemiological studies which are helpful for us to study disease occurrence in people who are exposed to factor and circumstances which have a role in disease etiology. So there are carefully designed research strategies to explore disease etiology. So there are steps that are involved in outbreak investigations, which include, we always want to know that how the uh, outbreak or epidemic happened. And to establish the causes, there, there are certain steps that include establishing the existence of, of an outbreak, verifying the diagnosis, preparing for field work, using descriptive epidemiology, defining and identifying cases, developing hypothesis, evaluating it, defining it, implementing control and prevention, prevention measures, communi communicating the findings. So this is a comprehensive chart which explains the different epidemiological studies that are used for identifying and for ident identifying the measures. So it can be broadly divided into observational like, and experimental studies. Uh, the experimental studies include clinical trials and community trials. The clinical trials are normally reserved for postgraduate studies or they require advanced scientific labs for uh, research purposes and for bringing new medicines into the into the public. So whenever new medicines or new vaccines or uh, uh, new measures are brought, uh, like them are brought to the public, they have to go through experimental studies, which include clinical trials and community community trials, which are which require advanced scientific labs that are present in certain hospitals. They are present even in Karachi, for example, in. Dow University Hospital, Oja, and in Ahan University Hospital. And then we have another group of studies that are called observational studies. It can be divided into descriptive epidemiology and analytical epidemiology. 
the descriptive epidemiology includes cross directional studies, case studies, and correlational studies. The analytical epidemiology includes case control studies and cohort studies. Okay, so what is descriptive epidemiology? The descriptive epidemiology is the aspect of epidemiology concerned with organizing and summarizing health related data according to time, place, and person. And it basically collects, it relates, it is related with collection and analysis of data. And the, by, by which it means that patterns of disease occurrence by person, time, and place. So it is dependent upon time, place, and person. Uh, which are standard dimensions used to track the occurrence of the diseases. And it is very important, uh, as we'll see in further slides. So as I told you earlier, it is concerned with observing distribution of disease in human populations and identifying the characteristics in which disease seems to be associated. Time distribution, place distribution, person distribution. So before we further uh, go into uh, that study, we need to identify that what we first identify and define the, uh, what sort of population is, uh, is, uh, is being studied in a particular study. For example, population is defined in a uh, particular study in terms of total number of persons, age, sex, occupation, cultural characteristics, and similar information for study needs. And a representative sample is taken from it, uh, which can be specially selected groups and particular age group. For example, if we are defining elderly people and we are categorizing it from 55 to 70, so the, we have uh, we have uh, compartmentalized our age group from 55 to 70 and turned it elderly in our research. Then sex groups, male or female, or hospital patients or school children. So population needs to be defined. And it does not. Uh, it needs to be large enough so that it remains meaningful. The our results are meaningful. Then we have disease. We have definition of disease. The definition of disease needs to be precise and valid to identify those who have disease from those who do not. And for example, if we are doing a study on prostate uh, cancers, so uh, uh, in a study. So we will identify that how will we identify disease in the in our study. So for example, we identify disease, prostate cancer that those who have prostate and cancer will have elevated serum PSA levels, with prostate specific antigen levels, and they have uh, positive digital rectal examination findings like hard indurated mass, uh, uh, hard indurated mass on DRE. So that that would be categorized as. Uh, uh, people who have prostatic cancer. So we would use this definition for identifying uh, positive disease in our research. So all of the people who report positive prostate cancer need to have those findings. And what is the benefit uh, of defining a disease? That if, Because if the definition of disease is not valid, then it would be a source of error in presentation and comparability of measurements from different sources. Then time distribution is very important. The pattern of disease described by time of its occurrence raises question whether disease is seasonal in occurrence, shows periodic increase or decrease. Three kinds of trends are commonly identified. There are short-term fluctuations, long-term fluctuations, and periodic fluctuations. As the uh, name identifies, the short-term fluctuations is, uh, is related with comparatively short duration of time. Fluctuations in relatively short duration of time are observed. Long-term fluctuations include those diseases which in which there is fluctuation in disease occurrence over a long period and periodic fluctuations mean that there is no fixed time duration association. Then there is place distribution. It is the geography of disease, cultural standard of living, external environment results in different disease patterns. For example, in different societies, there are different sort of diseases that are occurring. For example, due to relative high uh, due to uh, uh, high uh, uh, hygiene standards in developed countries and in the Western world, there are uh, less number of contagious diseases like hepatitis A, typhoid, cholera, trachoma in those diseases uh, compared with uh, the developing world like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, in which contagious diseases like uh, trachoma or diseases that are transmitted through fecal oral contamination like hepatitis A, typhoid, these are 
these are reported more and more in the developing world. So this is due to the different cultures and standard of living in external environment. So at a broader level, it examines the comparison of mortality and morbidity in relation to dietary differences, socioeconomic factors, and cultural differences. Okay, so this is a spot map of cholera in London. It says uh, it shows that the place distribution. So this uh, it happened. It was uh, reported back by John Snow in 19th century. At that time, the cholera was not identified and isolated as a separate pathogenic organism. So John Snow was the first person who who first uh, established the cause between the this pathogen. And the diarrhea, uh, the high, uh, the high number of patients who had diarrhea and who were dying from the disease. So basically, what happened was there was an infected water reservoir and uh, the a water pump that was used to extract water from that source. So whatever population, the population residing there in that area and using that water reservoir was getting infected and getting diarrhea, and they, there were a high number of deaths reported within within one to two days from that disease. So John Snow identified that there is the pathogen called cholera, which is causing that disease. So he uh, he requested the administration to uh, stop people from using that uh, water reservoir and that water handle pump. So after, uh, after his advice was followed, the number of cases subsequently dropped and the uh, number of deaths subsequently declined, which showed that there was a pathogen that was responsible for causing uh, high diarrhea and high number of deaths. So the yellow area on the map indicates the part of Soho where the greatest number of cholera deaths occur. As we move to the uh, orange, red, and purple to blue area, the density of cholera cases drops. So the hotspot of the this is uh, occurrence was the place that was in vicinity of that infected reservoir. So as I explained earlier, the Broad Street Farm was made famous by John Snow. Discovery, he made a map by painstaking analysis of the same data that led him to conclusion that Broad Street Farm was the source of the Soho epidemic. When the pump handle was removed and people were prevented from using it, the epidemic came to an end. And many lives were saved, and cholera was confirmed as a water borne disease. So, uh, the des descriptive epidemiology may use cross sectional or longitudinal design to obtain magnitude of disease. So, how do we differentiate cross sectional and longitudinal studies? Basically, how we define cross sectional studies is the name indicates it is basically a snapshot uh, of a disease. Uh, in a particular community at a particular time. This is basically you are taking a picture from a camera to study that what is the disease prevalence uh, at a particular time. So it is based on a single examination or cross-section of population at one point in given time. The results of which can be projected to the whole population. It is also called prevalence study. It is helpful for chronic diseases like hypertension in which we collect data regarding age, sex, body weight, and other factors. And uh, we can determine how prevention is related. It tells us about distribution, but not natural history or incidence. So the example of cross-sectional is, for example, we are checking that what is the awareness and self-care practices of elderly men regarding prostate diseases in Karachi, Pakistan. So this is a study that was being conducted to check the awareness and self-care practices of elderly men regarding prostate diseases. So it was basically a snapshot of, uh, of knowledge and practices regarding prostate disease in the elderly men. In comparison to cross-sectional studies, there are longitudinal studies. Longitudinal studies can be defined, for example, this is a short film. This is a basically in which we follow through a particular community over a period of time. To, con to reach to a particular uh, uh, particular result. So th these are the observations repeated in population, same population over a prolonged period of time by means of follow-up examination. Cross-sectional studies are like a photograph, while longitudinal studies are like a film. The longitudinal studies are difficult to organize and time-consuming. The descriptive epidemiology is very helpful in providing data regarding magnitude of disease, disease etiology, and 
uh, ideological hypothesis, existing of causal association between factor and disease, and it provides background data for planning, organizing, and evaluating preventive and curative services. Also, it describes variation in disease. Then, uh, this is the flowchart of uh, different study types that we studied earlier. The next type of studies are analytical studies. It includes case control and cohort. In contrast to descriptive, they are looking at entire population. The subject of interest is individual within the population. And it can be case control and cohort studies. So how do we differentiate between descriptive and analytic? Descriptive defines when was the population affected. Analytic describes how was the population affected. Describe descriptive would be where was the population affected and who was affected. Whereas in analytic, it would describe why was the population uh, affected. Uh, it can be exemplified. Uh, analytic can be exemplified by a study of heart disease comparing a group who eats healthy food and exercises regularly with one who does not. Whereas in descriptive, it is used to describe the eating habits of an adolescent of age 13 to 18 years in a community. So analytic can be described into case control, which can be de defined as subjects identified as having a disease are compared with subjects without the same disease. So cases are the uh, group which have the disease and controls are the one who do not have the disease. And they both are asked about the risk factor. So cases are the one with the disease while the controls do not have the disease. Case controls, they have three distinct measures. The exposure and outcome have occurred before the start of study. It uses the control or comparison group to support and inference. It involves two population cases and controls. These are basically comparison studies. The cases and controls must be comparable to this, uh, with respect to factors such as age, sex, occupation, and social status. The questions are related to the person characteristics and exposure, which may be responsible. For example, one can use a scale to immunize children and use as controls to immunize children and look for factors of interest. Used for study of many cancer studies like cirrhosis. Case control. Subject with example, subject with diabetes are controlled compared with those without diabetes. Then we have cohort. Cohort is followed over time to see what happens to uh, what happens to people and information about risk factor is collected. We can then compare the appearance of outcome like disease in those who are exposed to a particular factor to those who are not exposed. It is measured by relative risk factor. For example, this is a very famous British doctor study which established harmful effects of smoking over a long period of time with lung cancer. So in 1950s, there was not a particular, uh, uh, there was no particular knowledge that smoking causes lung cancer or not. But this is study, which was a cohort study established that uh, it uh, identified the relation between smoking and lung cancer, and it followed the group over a long period of time. And it was started by a group of doctors in 1930s, and it was conducted on doctors who were smoking. And over a long period of time, the changes were observed. And the people who were chain smokers or who used to sm uh, who smoke for a long period of time reported an increase in incidence of lung cancer. So this is the summary. Case control is retrospective, while cohort is prospective. Case control compares disease groups versus non-disease. Cohort compares exposed versus non-exposed. Those who are smoking versus those who are not smoking. Looking to establish causation is in case control, and in cohort we are establishing association. Then we have the history of how the disease happens. So there are different theories of how disease happens. Uh, first of all, which is wheel of disease causation. The wheel of these disease causation was introduced by the Kramer and Mosner in 1985. It de-emphasizes the agent as a sole cause of disease. It emphasizes the interplay of physical, biological, and social environment. It also brings genetics into the mix. So this is a wheel which includes a lot of factors, for example, physical, biological, and social. Uh, so, will disease model discriminate between necessary and sufficient factors? So, this is the wheel. As you can see in the center, there is the genetic core, which we get, which is hereditary, which we get from our parents. Then we have biological, social, and psychological factors. The biological factors include age, sex, body mass, labor, level of activity, and smoking. The social factors include 
environment, which can be social, economic, education, smoking, marriage. The psychological include in environment includes pain, anxiety, depression, smoking. So all of these are responsible, and this is the wheel of position. Then there is web of position. The web of position explains that there are a multiple complex web of uh, factors that are responsible for a disease position, which can be, for example, if we are studying about hypertension and uh, other cardiovascular diseases, it can be due to our diet, which is written for the soil. It can be due to our stress. It can be due to less of physical activity. It can be due to genetical factors like one of our uh, family members or uh, first degree relatives suffering from uh, cardiovascular disease. It can be due to obesity. It can be due to hormonal imbalance. It can be due to our uh, personality type. It can be so what a lot of factors, but this is like a web which is responsible for causing a particular disease. So it is suited for study of chronic disease and it considers all the predisposing factors and their in, uh, complex interrelationship. And sometimes the removal of one link is sufficient to control the disease. Then there is natural history of disease. So this theory deals that there is a particular uh, model that every disease is, uh, every disease follows. Uh, and uh, before, uh, uh, until it affects our human body, and, uh, and either it leads to stage of recovery and disability. So, for example, first of all, there is a stage of susceptibility in which the person is exposed to uh, a particular pathogen. It can be prevented by primary prevention, to, which is intended to reduce new occurrences. Then there is a stage of subclinical disease in which there is incubation period. The, the pathogen is entered into our body but it, uh, it, the, the symptoms are not manifest in a person. It can be prevented by secondary prevention, which includes screening, early diagnostic, diagnostic measures to reduce duration and severity. Then uh, uh, the incubation period is apparent, the disease manifests itself and shows signs and symptoms, which is the stage of clinical disease. Tertiary prevention is helpful here, which is intended to reduce complication and disability. So the level of prevention are primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. And then after the stage of clinical disease, either there is a stage of recovery or there is disability or death. If the person is getting treatment, he will, he or she would recover. And if, if the person is not getting treatment, if the person is not immunized, then it would lead to disability or death. Okay, then the, there is epidemiological trial model. This disease, this model explains that there is a triad that is responsible for causing disease. The triad includes agent, that is the pathogen responsible for disease. Then there is the environment and then there is the host. The agent uh, can have uh, particular characteristics, which includes the toxicity, the virulence, the infectivity, the susceptibility to antibiotics, the ability to survive outside body, the uh, uh, the uh, genetical mutation strains uh, in that agent. For example, there are new strains every now and then of COVID virus. So uh, it, it is a genetically ability to modify. Then there is our, there is environment, which includes climate. Certain diseases are more common, uh, thrive in certain environment. For example, the uh, neglaria fowleri, which causes brain death, and brain-eating amoeba thrive in mild warm waters, mild warm fresh waters, then physical structures, population density. There are certain diseases that are more common in high population density for, uh, and unhygienic environment, social structures in poverty, certain diseases like hepatitis A, typhoid, cholera, trachoma, these all diseases thrive. So environment is very important. And then dimensions to uh, minimize the environmental uh, Effect on disease can be housing quality, sanitation, water, preventive services. Then there is host. The character host is the person in which the agent causes the disease, which is responsible for, which is necessary for disease development. The characteristics of host can be age, prior exposure, susceptibility, co-infection, and the immune response, the capability of human to fight back the disease. The interventions can be to treat, isolate, immunize the person uh, boosting his ability to fight the disease and the nutrition, the balanced diet. So the, intervention, the interventions can be 
then that we can educate the person, we can help a person to follow quarantine to prevent him from spreading the disease. So this is the epidemiological trial, agent, environment, and so Okay, so natural history of disease. As I uh, told you earlier, there's some common interaction between man, agent, and environment. The key concept in epidemiology is that each disease has unique natural history, which is not necessarily the same in all individuals. This is the natural history of disease. As I told you in that chart, there is a particular uh, subclinical period, the clinical period, the uh, recovery or disability period. So there is pre pathogenesis period in which, which is preliminary to the onset of disease. The disease is not entered at, uh, but the factors favoring exist. The causative factors may be classified into agent, growth, and environment. So moving on, the pathogenesis in which the disease has entered and there is a subclinical phase. The disease multiplies and induces physiological changes and it progresses to periods of incubation and early and late pathogenesis. This can be modified by interventions such as immunization and chemotherapy. And the final outcome may be recovery or death. So the disease agent is substance living or non-living, forces tangible or intangible, the excessive presence or related lack of which may initiate a disease process. The agent may be biological agent, living agent or disease. It includes infectivity, ability to invade and multiply, pathogenicity, ability to induce clinical illness, virulence, proportion of cases resulting in clinical manifestation, nutrient agents, uh, physical agents, chemical agents, mechanical agents. Then there can be absence of excess of factors, hormones, and dyes. Then can, there can be social agents. Environmental factors. Environment is basically everything that is external to individual human host. Living and non-living with which he is in constant interaction, air, water, housing. It can be divided into physical, biological, and psychosocial. Physical environment is physical factors, air, water, soil, climate, geography, heat, light. So developing countries definitely defective environment continues to be problem. But in developed uh, nations, due to scientific environment, uh, uh, the environment has significantly been altered and the quality of life has been affected. The biological environment is universe of living beings that surround including humans. Other include microbial agents, rodents, animals. There is constant readjustment to maintain harmonious relationships. Then risk factors. For many diseases, the agent is not firmly established. Etiology is discovered in terms of risk factors. Attributed exposure is associated with development of disease. Observable and identifiable prior to the agent. May be truly positive, for example, smoking for lung cancer or merely contributing. For example, lack of exercise or lack of uh, uh, lack of uh, a, a healthy diet in development of uh, congestive heart disease or cardiovascular heart disease. Then host factors may be classified as demographic, age, sex, ethnicity. So a particular ethnicity is more prone to developing diseases like, for example, uh, South Asian. Uh, people are uh, more prone to developing uh, diabetes or gestational diabetes. Then biological characteristics, genetic, biological, social and economic factors, lifestyle factors, sedentary lifestyle, living style factors, and especially in our region, leads to a number of diseases. Then there are modifiable versus non-modifiable risk factors. Modifiable risk factors which may be modified, for example, our diet, exercise, and uh, our smoking habits and non modifiable are which cannot be modified. For example, our age, our genetics, uh, uh, etc., they cannot be modified. But they, they are very important that uh, the modifiable, modifiable risk factors are told to the individual so that they can, uh, they can adopt their living style accordingly to prevent disease development. Thank you. That is all.